Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Book Fest Spring 2021. This is the panel, Books That Force You to See the World Differently. And it's kind of an unusual panel in that it mixes both fiction and nonfiction authors. So this is going to be kind of an interesting discussion um, today. And one of the things uh, we have in common is that it's, it's a very diverse panel of people from different backgrounds. So why don't we go through and just give a, a brief uh, rundown of who you are and what you've written um, and, and tell everybody what you're, what you, what's going on. Steve, we, we start with you. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Joseph and uh, who I am, I am an attorney. I uh, negotiate for a living. I also teach uh, effective negotiation techniques and uh, because of that, uh, I started writing a book, A Grown-Up Guide to Effective Crankiness, The crank it source Method. So if, if you want to be an effective negotiator, you also have to know how to be effectively cranky. So this is the book. Uh, and before that, I wrote The Last Surviving Dinosaur, The Tyranta crank it source because uh, why we are cranky, we all evolved from the smallest but most dangerous dinosaur on the planet, the Tyranta Crankosaurus. She kept, Saurus is the Yiddish word for problems, and this dinosaur kept cranking out her Saurus, so all the other dinosaurs disappeared until eventually we evolved from this little dinosaur. And that's why we're cranky. Hmm. Well, we'll uh, I'm looking forward to delving more into that uh, subject, because it's, it's a good one. Uh, Carol? I love that, the evolution of crankiness. <laughs> so my name is Carol Stivers. I'm a retired biochemist and currently a science fiction author. And my debut novel is somewhere around here. Oh, here it is. It's The Mother Code. Uh, it was uh, released in August 2020. Uh, brief synopsis of the book is that uh, in the year 2054, a boy named Kai is born alone in the America's desert southwest his only companion, his mother, who happens to be a super soldier robot. Uh, the Mother Code is the story of how Kai and his mother grow to understand that both themselves and the world that made them. And it ends with a decision, will Kai break his bond with his mother or will he fight to save the only parent he's ever known? Um, in addition to the US, the book is sold in 14 countries around the world and it was uh, licensed by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Partners, well optioned for uh, film rights. Woohoo! Wow, that's pretty good for a debut novel, Carol. Congratulations. It's terrific. Um, Nancy. Yes, my name is Nancy Hyde. I'm a certified financial planner and a fiduciary, which makes me a little bit unusual in the financial industry today. Most financial advisors are not certified financial planners, nor are they fiduciaries. And my book is very unique, The Retirement Mirage, Time to Think Differently, what I've tried to do here is to share with people what is really happening in the 21st century. And I wrote the book because I was absolutely frightened about what I was seeing happening in the real world about telling people about retirement. And so I'm basically a positive mm -hmm. person and optimistic. The book is basically based on that, but I think it's a very interesting group of stories. You do not need to have any financial background to read the book, and we'll get into it in a little bit more detail, I think, later on in the discussion. Great. Thanks, Nancy. Edgar, you're, on, you're our other fiction author. Tell us about uh, yourself and your book. Hi, I'm Edgar Scott. Um, I am trained as an economist. Um, I spent the majority of my working life until I reinvented myself as a writer, um, as a, a DevOps engineer, a computer programmer, database administrator, all that good stuff. Um, and I have written a book called 418, which is a uh, a speculative fiction. Um, it was, um, you know, number one in hard science fiction, uh, you know, on Amazon for, for a little while. Um, and it, um, it, it proposes the idea of an immersive internet. And if we had an immersive internet, we'd have programmable labor because, you know, we can put a chip in your head and, and we can make you do stuff. You don't have to feel you're going to work. You can still stay on the internet, surf all day, have a good time. When I introduce that idea to people, they say, that's great, I'd love that. The problem is, is what would you pay those people 
just about nothing. And then what happens to the rest of society as you pay people nothing? And it, my story is about two men who try to make their lives better. So in, in some ways, it's a self-help book. <laughs> but it's <laughs> That's good. Uh, Janet. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Janet Brill. I am a nutritionist. I'm an expert in health, wellness, cardiovascular disease prevention. I've written uh, four books. And my latest book is Intermittent Fasting for Dummies. It's my first uh, foray into a dummies book. It is also uh, different from all of my other books because it's more about um, a diet as opposed to uh, focused on like lowering cholesterol and cardiovascular disease prevention. This is very, very different. So um, I'm excited to uh, go into more detail about what this is about. Oh, great. Um, and I'm Christina Hogue. I'm a former journalist and foreign correspondent. I worked, uh, covered uh, stories in 14 countries in Latin America, worked for the Miami Herald and the AP and various newspapers. And now I write novels and freelance. Um, and these are my two books. One is Girl on the Brink. It's about, uh, it's a YA story about dating violence, a girl who gets involved with the wrong guy and with some disastrous consequences, but she comes through and it has a, a good, happy ending. And this is the other one, Skin of Tattoos, which sort of evolved from uh, interviews I did with gang members, both in El Salvador and here in Los Angeles. And it sort of still tells the story of gang members beyond, underneath the skin of tattoos, what they're just kind of uh, lost kids looking for jobs and, and belonging, sense of belonging. So those are my two uh, books. So uh, let's delve in. Um, so we've got a really diverse, as I mentioned, diverse uh, panel here from all different backgrounds that don't actually involve writing on the surface of it. So how did you all decide to write a book or get into writing? Was this something that you had always wanted to do? Um, you know, do you have like a bunch of novels in your in your bottom of your desk drawer? Um, or is this, uh, yeah, just why, why you got into this and why you decided to tell the story that, that you're telling? Um, Edgar, why don't we start with you? you, said you okay. Um, I absolutely have a hard drive with novels and actually, uh, you know, 100,000 word novels that will never see the light of day. Um, probably the wisest thing you can do as a young writer is whatever you write, put it aside, <laughs> think about it, get a good editor. Um, why did I do this? Um, I was working as an IT guy and I have for, for 25 years and I've watched I've watched the IT world race to the bottom uh, with respect to costs and services provided and shifting things you know, away from the IT guys, uh, services pr provisioning towards the individuals as a way of cutting costs. And I figured, you know what? We have, are on the cusp of technologies that can do that to people. And I saw some of those technologies, um, you know, maybe in the form of a set of eyeglasses that you could easily start to put the Internet right in someone's head. And then I just moved it inside their head. Honestly, all we need to do to experience the world is to stimulate those parts of your brain. So I thought that I had to write this story because I went, if we do this, what what it, what is the natural knock on that we're going to get? We're going to get you know, a whole bunch of people getting paid absolutely nothing. And, 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 you know, I thought that was actually quite dangerous. So I was inspired to do it. I thought it was a fun book. I had a lot of fun writing it. There's a lot of little storylines and which is ironic because I really tried to keep it simple. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we can talk about death as a, as a new invention of oneself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the success formulas that my characters have to go through, these are common to all people who are successful. Um, and, and so I lay those things out for people. Um, I enjoyed it. I had fun. That's why I wrote it, because I needed to share that. Yeah, and it sounds like you 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 blended economy, you know, economics with the what if scenario. You know, what if is the classic sort of science fiction uh, futuristic scenario. What if this happened, and you had that knowledge about labor economics and everything? So you were I I certainly did, if I may continue, um, because it, the economics is a very rational study of you know why do you think people 
people do certain things. So I thought that it was a very good explanation as to why people would behave this way if we could make it so that they never needed to come offline. And, and so yeah. it, it used it as my explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Steve, so are lawyers particularly cranky people or is this what you found and spurred you on to write about crankiness? How did, how did you happen onto this particular subject and, and, and want to write about it? Well, it's it started uh, actually uh, with uh, my partner, who's now my wife. We were in Rome, and she was having a cranky moment or a, a bunch of cranky moments together, and it just finally came out of my mouth that she was being a tyrannic crankosaurus, and and that's where I came up with my theory. That's how how we all evolved. There was one little tyrannic crankosaurus who was cranking out a saurus. Uh, Soros again being the Yiddish word for problems, uh, and uh, uh, that became a story. Also, I just like a few months later I wrote the story, and uh, and then somebody did a, like a review said I didn't write enough about overcoming crankiness, and and the whole point was to embrace or accept our crankiness. That's who we are, uh, since we all evolved from this this dinosaur. So I started writing. I started writing a blog, and I still write uh, after the show. I'm going to be doing some uh, getting on your nerves, crank and source, which is uh, another story. But uh, uh, kept writing and writing and writing different stories, uh, combining uh, mindfulness, uh, empathy, and humor. Uh, I tried to put the three together and, and talking about how to be effectively cranky. Was this a sort of cathartic exercise for you? Did you work out some of your own crankiness in, in doing writing this or? Uh, yes, uh, there, there was actually one chapter in particular, uh, Drive Me Crazy Crankosaurus. And in that chapter, uh, there's two, li two lines that are in everybody's head. The first line, it drives me crazy when, and then somebody does something that you have to say, it drives me crazy when, this happens. And then the next sentence in your head, I cannot understand how, and then again, you fill in the blank. And when those two sentences put, get attached in your brain at the same time, it lets out the crank at Soros. And I tell the story about all these people interacting with each other and they all have that exact same experience for different reasons. And it was cathartic because I, that happens to me a lot. And, and then I realized, uh, yeah, they could get on my nerves, whatever, but I don't have to be driven crazy. I could just breathe through it and, and accept it. So that, that was probably the most cathartic chapter in the book. Great. Nancy, what, uh, what prompted you to start uh, writing? It was really not my first idea to write a book. This kind of came from a lot of my clients that I've helped through the years uh, solve different financial problems. And one of the continuous issues that kept coming up was clients would say to me, why don't you write some of this down so we can share them with our children and grandchildren. You've helped us in so many different ways that other people have not done before. And I started to think about that. And I said, you know, we're now in the 21st century and I would feel comfortable sharing some of the stories of my clients, which are what are in the book. Of course, I've changed their names, different financial issues that they have had. Helping people is really a passion of mine. And I've helped hundreds of people over the years go from point A to point B and understand what retirement means in the 21st century when we're all living longer. And it's not unusual to live to be 100 years old. Now, when I was a young person growing up, there was a, on the Today Show, they'd have a segment and they'd hold up a picture. Bessie Smith is 100 years old today. And I think it was Willard Scott that used to do that. And after a while, there got to be so many people like Bessie Smith that they cut out the segment. And being unusual as a certified financial planner and a fiduciary, I plan people out to 100. And when I, when I tell other financial people I do that, they say, 
that's ridiculous. And I say, no, it is not. We have so many different wonderful adventures to be going on the rest of our life. Many of us will be retired more years than we actually worked. So these are all the kinds of issues that we have to take a look at. Now, <clears throat> similar to uh, Dr. Brill, cooking is a hobby of mine. I don't know if it's a hobby of Janet's, but I set up the book to make it like a recipe where you break everything down piecemeal so it isn't overwhelming. There isn't anything in the book that whether you have ever had any financial schooling or you don't have to go to Harvard or MIT or take an economics course like Stephen has done and Edgar to understand the issues that we're going to be talking about. These are everyday problems, whether it be about credit risk and what happens when you, you let your credit cards run over uh, and you end up with three or four. How do we get rid of that and how do we get to the next point? So the book kind of uh, takes, takes us through different issues. You can read one chapter at a time, put the book down, then put it back pull it back up. It isn't a story that goes from chapter to chapter, but there, there's even a section in there about what parents can do to help children as young as four years old start to understand what financial concepts are. Just as a simple uh, item that I mentioned, we put the four-year-old in the cart when we go shopping. They love to have their eyes running all over the place. Most supermarkets have a yellow sign or a green sign when something's on sale. We can have the children start pulling those signs out for us and say, Mom or Dad, there's a yellow sign over there. Let's take a look. What are they trying to show us? So that they can understand the value of buying something that they might like, but buying it on sale. And so even as young as four years old, we can start to have fun and games with money and how it works and what we need to do as parents and as adults to make our life much more stable financially. So as I say, you know, I say to people, uh, Christina, I live in Boca Raton, Florida. When people come to visit me, they bring bikinis and suntan lotion. I live here in Florida, so I know it can rain on one side of the street and not the other. So I have an umbrella in the back seat, and I try to share with people financially that we need to have some umbrellas for those rainy days. We don't like the rainy days. We know the sun is coming, but we still need to be protected from the rain. So that's kind of the focus of the book and why I got started writing it. And it was number one on Amazon last month in its category. Mm -hmm. Time at Mirage, time to think differently. Mm, that's great. Yeah, we certainly live in a financially complex society, I, I have to say, where there's taxes, credit, there's many different aspects of, um, of dealing with money that people don't really understand. So I think that's a great idea. Um, Carol. Well, keep it simple, Christina. K I S S, yeah. keep it simple, sweetie. That's it. Yeah, One that's of my key mottos. I know we have another word for S, but I use sweetie. It makes mm -hmm. it uh, convenient and appropriate. But I also let people know there's only three things you can do with money. Spend it now. Spend it later. And that doesn't mean 30 years from now. It could be five years from now, three years from now. Or spend it never. We're going to give it to our children, our grandchildren, or charity. We do not do brain surgery. It is as simple as that. Yeah, that's great. Carol, you're uh, trained as a biochemist, and now you write novels, and apparently yeah. pretty good at it. So why did you turn to writing? Was this sort of a, a lifelong hobby or passion of yours, or what got you going on? Uh, so, so I guess, my, yeah, my trajectory is probably most like Edgar's, but uh, I, you know, I used to work in biotech. I worked in medical diagnostics for about 30 years. Um, in 2003, I, I just suffered from massive burnout. I was a project leader and I, a startup, I had to do a lot of, I, I got up to, you know, a director of R&D and I just had to do a lot of layoffs and things like this. And I just, uh, so I just pulled back and I, and I, I said, well, I started a, a, a consulting business instead. And um, I think I'm not like Edgar in that I didn't have a lot of novels sitting in a drawer somewhere. I just, uh, I kind of dabbled in writing short stories and I continued doing that. But in uh, the summer of uh, 
I think it was, well, really that summer I started, I went on a trip with my family in the desert Southwest and uh, I just got inspired. I, I just pictured this, this apocalyptic scenario. And I thought, well, if I was ever going to write a novel, it would probably be science fiction because I know about science and I feel more comfortable, even though a lot of the short stories I was writing were not at all science-y. Um, so uh, it took me about till about 2018 actually to come up with something that I thought was uh, good enough to try and get an agent for. And I worked with developmental editors and things like that along the way. Um, took a lot of workshops and classes and that. Um, and when the time came, I, I did find an agent. And uh, But in my case, the mother code was like my writing training wheels. I mean, there's probably like a billion versions of it there are sitting either in a computer or hard copy around my office. Um, so now I'm a full-time author and I'm very uh, enjoying it very much as a second career. Yeah, that's great. Um, Dr. Janet, now you've got four books under your belt, so you're probably the most experienced uh, published author on the panel. Uh, what got you going on writing in the first place and, and you know, what, what have you learned along the way, I guess, with, with writing these books? Well, I my mother is an author, so um, I came many, many years ago, I came up with an idea that I got from counseling people uh, and it, all of my um, books have a personal note because I feel like I'm a scientist, so I kind of use myself as a guinea pig. So years ago, I um, was counseling people about uh, their cholesterol. And uh, I noticed that a lot of a lot of my clientele um, were taking a statin medication to lower their cholesterol, and a lot of them were having side effects. So they asked me numerous times um, if there was an, an alternative, a natural alternative with food and, and exercise that could lower their LDL or their bad cholesterol level. So it was very serendipitous because at that particular time, um, I went to a, uh, to my um, internist and uh, took blood and he's like, your LDL is way too high and heart disease runs in my family. So I was like, I got scared and I wasn't quite ready. I was only 40 and I, I wasn't ready to get on the statin bandwagon. So, uh, at that time, so I did some research and found that there was uh, right at that time out of Canada, uh, some research showing a, it was called a portfolio diet, which um, they put people on a uh, combination, natural combination of different foods and exercise and found that it, uh, that program lowered people's cholesterol um, a significant degree which equated to a entry, an entry level statin. So I tried that myself and um, I was shocked because after about two months, my LDL dropped um, a crazy amount to a, a, a healthy level under a hundred. And that was only from eating almonds and oatmeal and walking every day. So I was like, I have to help other people uh, including my clients, um, to understand that there's a, another way. So I, uh, I came up with that idea and um, I was in the gym. And I thought, what do I call this? And I don't know why I, I the, um, the book Watership Down <laughs> came into my head and I was like, hmm, you know, I should do cholesterol down. And so it's so strange. So it was very, very exciting for me because um, I spoke to my mom and I'm like, mom, I have this great idea, but I don't want to write the book yet until I know that I can sell it. And she's like, okay. And she's like, well, let me give you, there's a, a you can uh, contact these, th this woman that she was in touch with that uh, for a, a small a nominal fee uh, would send out an email blast to all the literary agents that deal with uh, nonfiction, health and, and wellness. So I put together a query letter, sent out the, uh, the email blast, and it, it was just like a miracle because <laughs> nobody gets published on their first, on their first go around. And I got back 
just all positive reviews. And I actually chose my literary agent. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, hmm, well, let me think. New York City, that would be good uh, because that's, you know, the center of everything. And then I was like, hmm, Dan Brown, his literary agent looks good to me. He did quite well. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to go with her. And then she sold it to, she sold it. It was just a whirlwind uh, experience. And she sold my first book uh, to Random House. So um, that was how I got started on writing. And it's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, great. Yeah, yeah that is a, that's a, that's a great to, to hit it out of the, the park on your first yeah, go around. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, terrific. My mother's like, I can't even believe this. This is, uh -huh. you don't understand. I'm like, well, what's to not understand? She said, it's not. This doesn't happen every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So why is there, do you think, why there's been an explosion in self-help books in the last couple decades, I guess, and it just seems why, so it's such a popular genre. Why do we need self-help books to get, navigate life these days? Any thoughts on that? Why, why is, why is self-help books um, such a popular category? I think to? because people need help. <laughs> And they want to better their lives and they want to go to an expert that has been there, done that. And they want simple tips like Nancy was saying, you know, just A, B, C, tell me what to do. And uh, and if uh, it's so that I can do it myself, because I think we um, maybe are a little concerned about relying on other people. We want to do it ourselves. And so we want uh, advice that's uh, that's concise and that works. And so I think that that will, it will always be that way because uh, people like, especially now in our society, we, we want things like yesterday. So I think that that will always continue. Self-help books will always continue to be popular. Yeah. Any, anyone else? I think also, uh, especially with the internet and, and so many different things coming at you, your brain starts to become a little bit, uh, I don't want to say disorganized, but kind of messy. And uh, we need, uh, and, and I, I call it help books, not necessarily self-help books. Like George Carlin always said, if you did it yourself, you didn't need any help. You did it yourself. Uh, so the, the the thing about it, it, it just helps organize your clean. It, it tidies up your brain. It gives yourself like certain anchors. It gives it itself a little bit more organization. When you think about the particular thing you're looking for help in. And that's that's what a good self or help book would, would try to accomplish. Yeah, we're sort of living in an age of overload of information. You know, there's, there's so much information that does come at you every day on the internet, everywhere, um, and so many things. So I guess that the self-help book or an expert, you can read about their credentials and what they're saying and cut through the clutter. Um, yeah, Modern life is very complicated, and the media doesn't always provide us with the adequate guidance uh, that we need in many different areas of life, whether it be nutrition, like Janet says, she tried a, a program that works. So right away, she said, I have, I mean, she wants to share it with people and help them to get to the place where they want to get to. And I think as human beings, we do have a sense that we want to accomplish something, that we have done it. But that doesn't mean that we know everything. We need somebody to guide us with that, somebody that we can trust, have confidence in. And I think whether it be in nutrition, health, uh, financial issues, we need to have people that we can go to as our guides to help us make the right decisions getting to the next place. And each one of us is at a different place in our life, a different place nutritionally, financially, healthfully. And so we need to be as guides, all of us seem to be here today. We need to be flexible enough that it isn't one particular recipe, that we need to adjust the recipe for the particular individual. Add a little salt, take out a little wine, do something here and there to make it reasonable so that the person will stick with it and have success. 
We want all the people that we do self-help books for, and I guess you could say mine is one of those self-help books, uh, but in the financial area, we want them to be successful. We're not there to make it so complicated that, oh my God, you know, I can't do uh, the technology that Edgar has and his knowledge. I'd like to put Edgar on as a part-time person in my company. I could do something, somebody with his expertise. We, we can't be experts in all places. And so I think this is where the self-help book is real. And we call it self-help uh, maybe it's got self-guidance or direction or maps to help us get from point A to point B. We all know when we go on a trip in the automobile, uh, the, you need to have your GPS. I mean, if you don't want to get lost. Well, the same is true in life in many different areas of life. And we should not be embarrassed as human beings and Americans to say, I don't know how to do that, but I want to learn how to do that and be a better person nutritionally, health-wise, whatever it is, uh, financially. And so I really think these kinds of books will just become more popular as time goes on. Hmm. Edgar? If I may, um, I think to summarize, we have so much information. I have managed terabytes, petabytes of live information. Information is not power, it's potential. Taking action is power. So a self-help book gives you a recipe that you can follow. And that's why they're so popular. Well, I've never even heard of a petabyte. No. Uh, it's, 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 you <laughs> take a thousand, thing. yeah, take a thousand terabytes. A thousand terabytes, <laughs> oh God. And there's probably one for even more, or we'll get to one there, for even there more. There are, Giga and Exa, and yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's just, it's just, Mathematics. Yeah, infinite, infinite. Um, but the fundamentals are always the same. Information doesn't help you. Taking action does, and then seeing what you get. And that's what a self-help book gets us to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for our science fiction novelists, how did you research the future? So how did you, you know, science fiction involves always a lot of world building and um, going into, you know, predicting or imagining uh something that hasn't happened yet. So how, how did you go about that? And what did you do to sort of research and build your world? Carol. So, so uh, when you're building that future world, I think all you can do is look at the current, you know, political, social, social, political and technological trends and you kind of extrapolate them out to their logical endpoints and, and try to figure out, okay, where is this going? And, and uh, where would it go if it just left to its own devices? That's what I see a lot in a lot of science fiction. So like for the mother code, I had to um, try to look at advances in things like robotics and ectogenesis. Ectogenesis is like um, the, the development of an embryo in an artificial environment outside the yeah. uterus. And wow. um, if you Google on that, you find it says usually used in science fiction, but it, it turns out that there are some um, articles out there talking about animal models where they're actually doing that. So there, there's information to be had and, and um, I had to kind of imagine, okay, where are the, those fields going to be in 30 years? And uh, it's daunting, but it's sometimes fun to come up with uh, like products that people would buy in the future or what would, you know, if they're walking in an airport concourse or driving, what would they be driving? What would they be seeing? Um, so those are all fun little details that you can throw in there. But, um, you know, as far as... Uh, research. Uh, I think it's just to kind of have a, an eye to the way things are going and, and uh, try to figure out where they will go. Based right. on it's kind of, yeah, as you say, extrapolate is the, I guess is that, is that word. But it's uh, what Edgar? futurists do, you know, no, no right, exactly. Paul Harari is this, you know, he's mm -hmm. a kind of a, I think he's a futurist. He's a, he's very pessimistic. He's too pessimistic in my mind, but, uh, you know, you read those guys and you can see where they think things are going and you can decide whether you agree to. Mm -hmm. Edgar, go ahead. Oh, good. Um, I had so much fun, but what did I do to research it? Well, I had to write it down actually because it doesn't exist. Um, so, uh, and, and of course you talk to people. Um, one of the fun things that I talk about are self-driving cars. They're right around the corner. Uh, but that would redesign how the city works. You know, we, we would make entirely, we would just make right turns because a left turn is very dangerous in a right-hand drive country. 
Um, uh, and so you would redesign the entire city that way to just be all right turns. Um, you would also have cars that never park. They would drive around all day. Mm -hmm. So you actually increase traffic. Wow. Um, you, you, would have, you would have this division of people who would have, you know, um, some people would be able to afford a car, but you'd have to be very wealthy because the insurance of driving a manually operated car would be crushing. Um, so, you know, people on the lower end of the economic stratas would have to drive self-driving cars. There'd be no option. So you, you have great fun when you look into things like that. Um, and and, and you, what, what you got to do, and this is probably the thing that I was had a hard time with when I was, you know, doing my first writing, I have to write things that I know that I'm going to throw away. And I, I call that scaffolding writing because you can't really build a cathedral unless you put up some scaffoldings. And so I would have to write out, what am I, what is this really going to look like? And then chuck it so that I can rewrite it later and know the rules. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to use economics to make my rules actually make sense. That's yeah. how I do it. Yeah. I think that, that rule making rules is so important, right? It's something I had to learn. Uh, what are the rules of this world? And so if you're building a world um, and it's in the future, it's going to have a whole different rule set. Well, Carol, what I, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm so lucky because I'm a computer guy and computers follow rules. They do it really well. Mm -hmm. They don't always do what you think they're going to do, but they're following the rules. Why, do, why are we so, just to f take that one step further, fascinated by dystopia? It seems like everything written about the future is very dystopian rather than utopian. Um, why are, are we, are we naturally inclined toward the pessimistic or what do we, or what, is that what we really want to read about, what, uh, Carol? Yeah, I, I think the answer to that question goes all the way back to Aristotle, right? The, the uh, uh, the elements of story that make a story worth reading, the pity, fear, and catharsis, because he talks about conflict. And um, it's, it's it's a key element of story. If there's no conflict, you don't have a story. So a dystopian scenario offers all kinds of uh, opportunity for conflicts. And um, I, I just think they're more interesting to readers. And that's not to say that a, a utopia doesn't have its place like a uh, a dystopia might transform into a utopia throughout the course of a novel, or you could have a utopia that has kind of like a, a dark side or a darkly comical side that you can leverage. But uh, in general, you you got to have conflict. And, and, and I think that science fiction is about problem solving. So without a problem, there's nothing to solve. And there's no story that I was thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah, it just fit, fits in a natural, yeah, more dramatic and and on the conflict. Edgar, I, I, if I may, um, when we uh, when we talk about utopias, well, we, as soon as somebody says this is a utopia, nobody believes it. <laughs> so we have to actually. We we can only see the possible utopia through a dystopian lens. Um, satire being that great mirror in which we see everyone but ourselves. Um, and, and so that's why we end up with dystopias. But if you write a dystopia and it ends horribly, nobody's ever going to want to read it because there's no lessons. Mm. So you have to write a dystopia where you can actually say, oh, I get something. So I don't want to tell you what the thing is in my book that I, I give you, but I do give you something because otherwise there'd be no point and I shouldn't have written it. But yeah, that's why we write dystopias because we just wouldn't believe it if it was oh, all great. Yeah, no, don't believe that right. at all. Yeah. <laughs> that's skepticism. Beauty is in uh, the eyes of the beholder. And also uh, I, I loved some of the early reviews of my book, which talked about how hopeful it was. So, oh, okay. so it's, you know, it, it was hope to, amid, the, amid the grim yeah. reality kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, so you think, oh my gosh, I'm going into this and it's going to be all, no, it's not. Yeah. I think you have to leave people with hope, Carol. Uh, it's got it right. You have to leave people with hope. Otherwise, a dystopia is just misery. And, uh, you know, I, look, I, you can put that other book with the Russian classics that, you know, <laughs> aren't as sunny. But, um, yeah, that's what we all want to. We all want to feel better and know that there is a better world and we can have it, too. And we can have it. Yeah, exactly which segues back into sort of self-help category. Um, 
for our nonfiction authors, there's a lot written about nutrition and diet, a lot written about finances, um, a lot written about different emotional states. I'm sure there's stuff written about, um, ang you know, it's plenty on anger and, and crankiness. Was it difficult to find something that hadn't been written or to find your particular niche in your, in your subgenre, Steve? Uh, actually, there's not much on crankiness. Hmm. Uh, and you know when I when I would go online and looking for things on crankiness, it was all about how not to be cranky, uh, not about like hey it's it's good to be cranky and you need it, but how do you use it and and like so I, I talk about a crank at source, well and I, and I, I use for example I, I talk about like if, if you're coming into my house. I would say, Christina, take off your shoes. I just bought this thirty-dollar rug at Walmart. I don't want you to get dirt on the shoe on the on the, on the carpet uh, that I paid thirty dollars for. And so you you take off your shoes. Be very careful. But then we end up putting stuff on each other, which ends up hurting each other. So so you know that's where you know I, I talk about uh, you know we we still are going to be cranky. But how do we do it effectively? I'm writing right now, uh, getting on on my nerves, Crankosaurus, which is like uh, some people saying, "Oh, you have a lot of nerve. You have some nerve. You have no. Oh, he has no nerve." And we all eat, get each on each other's nerves, regardless of whether we have a lot of nerve, some nerve, or no nerve whatsoever. And actually, the person who has no nerve happens to be the most nervous person in the room. So, so you know, there, there's ways to think about it. Well, how do we deal with that? You know, we're going to be, you know, that's why we're all, it's dystopian, but we try to move into more calm, more peaceful, more meaningful uh, way about being ourselves that uh, it, it, it just works. And then, of course, there's the nervous breakdown. You can have a breakdown. Yeah, when your nerves are all yeah. shot. Yeah. 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 Um, Jan Dr. Janet, how, how about you? There's, there's a ton written about various diets and nutrition, and how did you come up with your particular niche and, and make your... Well, in, for my most recent book, uh, it's kind of an interesting story. I'm a scientist, and I only recommend um, science science based um i only have science based recommendations that i that i feel comfortable sharing with people so it was back in december 2019 when the um new england journal of medicine came out with a review article on the health benefits of intermittent fasting and i didn't know much about intermittent fasting at the time and so I read this and I was fascinated because actually it goes against everything that I was taught um, is right, which is typical, but you have to keep up. I feel like you have to keep up with science and science is changing. So um, I decided to write this book because I was asked uh, to do it. I didn't think I would ever write a dummies book, but my agent um, asked me if I'd be interested in it and the pandemic had just hit. So I was, I jumped at the idea because um, I needed something to focus on and nothing makes me happier than writing and researching. So uh, what makes my book different is that there's a, a ton of intermittent fasting programs that are on the internet, but mine is different because I, of course, am uh, very educated in, in nutrition and I combine uh, intermittent fasting with a plant-based whole foods, Mediterranean style diet, which is not very common. Most, most of the programs on, on intermittent fasting will combine it with um, a keto diet, which is, is super unhealthy. So mine is different. Uh, so yes, I took a different approach. Mm -hmm. I took something that's out there and I reformulated it according to my knowledge and what I feel is uh, more doable and a healthier long-term approach to this style of um, this lifestyle. Yeah, interesting. How do you define intermittent fasting? Would that be like one day a week, one day on, one day not on? How well, there's there are there's in in this book uh, there's quite a few a different number. There's about 
five or six out there in the in the in the um, universe that are very popular. So I go through each type. Uh, intermittent fasting is is different from anything I've written about because it's not a diet per se. It basically tells you um, not what to eat, but when to eat. But of course, I add the what to eat in as well. So it's um, it's different. It's basically uh, short term fasts that are repetitive which is very different from uh, long-term fasts. And what's amazing about intermittent fasting is it's very helpful, not only in, um, in improving, in helping people lose weight, and much less pain, there's much less pain involved in uh, weight loss because you can basically, you just automatically eat less calories because you're cutting out meals. So a common, uh, very popular approach to intermittent fasting would be the 16-8 program, where you um, fast for 16 hours, uh, you and then you eat in an eight-hour mm. eating window. So it's oh. there's different types of um, right. Of you can kind of make your own program almost. Uh, yeah. Well, you 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 pick the one that one, you, yeah. it is it's it's, 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 it's individualized. So to your lifestyle. So all I say is choose the one that works for you, but combine when you do eat, eat a very healthful plant-based Mediterranean uh, type of, uh, of um, diet. Mm -hmm. And so I consider it a three-pronged approach to um, health and longevity, intermittent fasting, combine it with a Mediterranean style of eating and add in uh, physical activity. And I think that that's the ultimate um, approach to mm -hmm. uh, longevity and, and good health. Yeah. Nancy, how about you? What was, uh, did you sort of have to set about looking at what's on the market as far as retirement planning and stuff and trying, trying to do something different? Or did you feel you had sort of different plan or approach to begin with? Well, in financial planning, you don't really want to be dystopian or utopian. You want to be in the reality scenario. Uh, using Janet's uh, nutritional program, people will not only live longer, but they'll live longer more healthfully. And as a result of that, that really changes the whole idea of retirement. When, uh, when Roosevelt put in Social Security, uh, at that point, most people had pensions they had life savings. And uh, if they lived to be 70 years old, that was considered a long time. So Roosevelt said, well, if we have to pay people with Social Security for five or six years, the government can handle it. Well, now that we're planning people out to 100, um, that's a completely different process. And uh, so I researched what was going on with Medicare, Medicaid, uh, what was the government going to be able to do as far provide as far as providing us with any kind of an income? And as the more I did the research, the more I come to find out that the programs are really running out of money before they run out of time. And that's what most people, when they come to me about uh, living a long time, they say, my biggest concern is running out of money before I run out of time. And I say, you want, I want you to know that is the biggest concern and it should be a concern. And they want to know what they can do to make it so that, that doesn't happen to them. And it is doable. And certainly being more healthful nutritionally makes a difference. Modern medicine can replace everything, as I tell people. Your hips, your knees, no matter what it is, you wear hearing aids, everything can be fixed. You may not have the quality of life that you had before, but you're not going to die from it. You don't even die from Alzheimer's. You may fall and something may cause you to die. Look, we're all here on a lease and we don't know when that lease is going to be up. So what we'd like to do is to have a situation where we have enough money. So what I try to do in the book is to empower people with knowledge and strategies so that they can become successful in their own particular situation. Um, as I said, very similar to what Janet talks about, there isn't one answer for everybody. You may have your own medical issues right now that we have to take a look at. You may have your own financial issues. You may have a disability currently. And so that creates different financial problems. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, Edgar mentions that the rules are the rules, but unfortunately when it comes to living, 
Our rules and our values in America in the last 75 years have changed. We have young people living together that are not married, and we accept that. But we also have 65-year-old people living together that are not married. Now, what kind of financial issues happen with them? I want you to know it can be a catastrophe. If you don't set up the finances correctly, if you're living together with somebody that you're not married with. And the government has a tendency to change the laws. Uh, used to be retirement accounts could be passed on to your children and they could take it out over their lifetime. Now it's set up so that if it isn't your spouse, it has to be dispersed to the government within 10 years. Why? Because they want the taxes and they want the money for the programs that they want to do. So this is, these are changes that have happened in the 21st century with most financial books. Matter of fact, none that I've read on the marketplace now address any of these issues. All the current advertisement continues to say, I have the product, you come to me, you're gonna, we're gonna solve your problem. My book doesn't discuss products at all. It talks more about behavior, financial mm -hmm. behavior, and what can we do to make those changes effective for us on our level. And so that's why I think it's very different and it's time to think differently. Uh, retirement may not be a 21st century concept for all of us. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to get around that. Okay, we have hobbies that we can make some extra money at. And I encourage parents to help their children develop their hobbies so that whether it's baking or, or 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 building items or building scaffolding, whatever it is, they have a hobby that they can eventually maybe make some money in. I happen oh, to be yes, yeah, I love what I do, so I don't plan on retiring. That's not true of everybody. Some of us are in, yeah. So we have to kind of be flexible. And in the book uh, on uh, the retirement mirage addresses those kinds of issues, but in mm -hmm. a very optimistic way. Okay, great. Well, it looks like this was a very really quick hour. Um, just to, to close off, a uh, quick lightning round. What are you working on next, uh, Steve? Well, uh, actually, what I'm working on is a kid's book. Uh, it should be coming out in December. It's called Snoodles, Kidoodles, Poodles, and Lots and Lots of Noodles. So, Very cute. Uh, so that, that'll be coming out in December. And the audio book of a grown-up guide to effective cranking this should be out in the next month. So Perfect. that should be a lot of fun. I got to listen to it. It's not my voice, but it's hysterically funny. Great. Carol? So my hard, copy, number two. my hard copy launch last year was uh, derailed by the pandemic. So uh, it was pushed back from May to August. And then in August, things still hadn't cleared up. So uh, in, on August 17th this year, they're going to launch the paperback. And it's got a brand new cover, which I really hmm. I kind of I love it. I think it's even, I'm trying to get it in the screen there. I think it's better than the previous cover. And, and so I'm really looking forward to that. I have some um, appearances lined up uh, at, at book clubs and also uh, vir in a virtual book club is right now and also a book a store here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which I'll, I'll post the um, times for those and, and et cetera uh -huh. yeah, and, uh, at, Carol, uh, Carol at uh, carolstivers.com and also uh, at uh, my Facebook author page, Carol Stivers Author. Um, you can find all that there. And uh, for sure, if you want to get a hold of me to do any events whatsoever, I'm available. I'm on board. Um, right now, I'm working on another novel. And this one is more like a first contact with aliens. And it's, mm. uh, it involves uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, brain evolution and also um, terrestrial climate change. Wow, fascinating. That's great. Dr. Janet. Um, I don't have any books on the back burner right now. I'm still focused on just helping people um, to move on from 2020. It was such a horrific year, worst of my life and so many others I know. So I'm trying to help other people put a, a, see there's definitely a light um, that we're all starting to see at the end of at the end of this tunnel, horrific tunnel we marched through. So I want to help people to um, 
change their life and focus on their health and well-being um, as we move forward and get and put 2020 behind us. Yeah, very much needed. Edgar? Oh, thank you. Um, there's two things that I'm working on. I would love to write a, a practical manual for the young person entering the workforce today. Uh, and it's inspired by my years as a as a as an IT manager, and uh, it would it would give people a, a a some understanding a manual so that they could deal with the the apparent um, uh, contradictions that they're being fed by various actors in their work world. The other thing that I'm working on, which is much more fiction and much more fun, is the idea of a woman who is pursuing her um, pursuing justice for the uh, the death of her husband. And the question I have is, can you embrace nihilism if your goal is to attain justice? Mm, very uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, very heady stuff. Nancy, we're, we're running out of time. So very quickly, what uh, what is on your burner? Well, uh, this book is really a summation of my life's work and purpose. I really don't see a need to write a book about this topic going forward. Uh, instead, I'm going to be focusing in on doing more interviews like this, which I love to do, get the word out, wake up America, that retirement, this is a focus that we really need to bring into the 21st century with modern technology and all the other changes that are taking place. And um, if anyone wants to contact me, they can certainly do it through my website, The Strategic Wealth Advisor and certainly take a look at my book. I think it would be very helpful. If, if I could afford it, I would send a copy of the book to everybody who is thinking about retirement in any way. And it, there is an ebook and there is a soft cover to make it easy for people to get. I wanna make it so that it becomes realistic in people's lives. Optimistic changes coming forward. Right. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone. It's been a really interesting panel and um, best of luck with all your uh, projects. And I hope to see you on Goodreads or, uh, you know, Facebook or wherever. <laughs>